Proverbs, chapter number 19. I'm going to read one verse, verse number 21. The Bible says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the countenance of the Lord, or the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Now, I say every time that we're in the book of Proverbs, Sometimes in Proverbs you can read four or five verses and they all have to do with the same topic. Other times you've got two thoughts within the same verse. And then the first ten chapters of the book of Proverbs are all one narrative. It's a metaphor of how you know, wisdom, being a lady, stands in the streets crying out and nobody responds to her call. And Proverbs, sometimes, you, there's a lot to unpack in a little amount of words. And other times there's a lot of words and there's a whole lot more to unpack. But... Today we read one verse because that's a verse that has to deal with what we're going to talk about. But I want you to notice by way of introduction, verse number one, or verse number 21. Okay, the second half, never left the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. If you want proof of that, the fact that you're heard in the Bible today is proof of the fact that God's counsel does stand. Right? The words of the Lord, they endure forever just like his mercies. It's forever settled in heaven. Right? Now, the counsel of, or the, counsel of the Lord also means, you know, when it comes to things that you search out from God. If God said it, you can take it to the bank. Amen. Not only has he forever settled his word, his counsel is always good. Sure. Okay, I mean, it's one of the things that aggravates me to death, but you go to a college and you enroll in classes, you can take the same class one year, and then if you were you know, so inclined to take it again the next year, you're going to have to buy a new textbook because they always revise it. They're always, changing, they're always updating, and that's how the world thinks. The newest, the better. Right? But the counsel of the Lord, I mean, our pastor said it, but one of Brother Clint's, you know, favorite things that he's used on visitation, we've heard that story a few times, right? If it's new, it's not true, and if it's true, it's not new. Right? right? There is nothing new under the sun, right. as Ecclesiastes tells us. Right? If it's true, it's been around since the beginning because God created it. Right. If it endures, if it lasts, it is not something that's not a new revelation. There's no private interpretation or private revelation of the Word of God. If it's true, it's been around. Chances are you're not the first person that it's dawned on. But God can use the same truth and cause it to apply to something new that is coming to your life. That's why the counsel of the Lord endures forever. There may be a truth that was written down a long time ago, but God may reveal that truth to you in a way that is particular and intimate and specific to the new thing that has come into your life. Right. right? There are basic principles that can be expounded upon and can be opened up and applied to specific situations, but there are some things that you may never encounter in your life, but somebody else may encounter that thing, and the same counsel of God can still apply to those different situations. Okay, now we are thankful of the fact that, you know, the counsel and the word of God they endure forever, that they are settled. I mean, we are not on the shifting sands. Jesus set, him, set us on himself, the rock, right? We have a solid foundation, and that is based off of God's holiness, God's righteousness. But because he is solid, because he is the rock with a capital R, right? He is settled. He's sturdy. He's something that we can build our life on, and it's not going to collapse away. Okay, we're done with the second part of the verse. Now, let's get to the thought for the lesson at the first half of the verse. There are many devices in man's heart. We know that the heart is deceitfully wicked that no man can know it. Right. Okay, we are aware of the teachings of the Bible that no man can know his own heart. We know that when the man of God, the prophet, went to go evaluate the sons of Jesse, he looked at the, some of the older sons of Jesse, he said, surely this one's going to be the king. What was God's remark? Man looketh on the outward appearance, God looketh upon the heart. We can evaluate ourselves or other people based off of what we see, but that doesn't mean that we truly know their heart. But the devices of the heart that we cannot see, or even when it comes to ourselves, we can't even begin to know our own heart. Those devices, verse number 21 tells us, are many. Now, this word devices brings to mind that we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. Right? These are not talking about the devices of the devil, although... Certainly, we want to avoid those devices. Right? Those, those things are called traps for a reason, because they work. It wouldn't be called a trap if it didn't keep you trapped. Right. Right? But these aren't talking about the devices of the devil, although we can draw that comparison. There are many devices, but we're not ignorant of those devices. 
And just like we're not ignorant of the devil's devices, we are not ignorant of some of the devices of our own heart. We can't know the thoughts or the desires or the wickedness of our own heart, but we have seen throughout the Bible, throughout history, throughout personal experience, we have seen how the heart can work. Those devices that this verse is talking about. So with the help of the Lord, we're going to teach you this point of the devices of the heart. The devices of the heart. Now these are things that, I mean, we heard on Wednesday night as Brother Amos preached on, you know, the shield of faith and the whole armor of God. These are things that we are meant to safeguard ourselves from. God has given us the tools in order to safeguard against the devices of the heart. God would not, in his holiness and in his righteousness, save us only for us to be, or come and, uh, to be succumb to the desires or the devices of our own heart. God would not tell us to live holy and be holy because he is holy if our own heart would conquer us and not allow us to do that. He has made us kings and priests, kings so that we can rule and reign over this body and this flesh. That includes your heart. Now first, when it comes to the devices of the heart, we have to see, you know, metaphorically, as throughout the Bible, what the heart is a picture of. We know that we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and then in Luke's account he says, with all our body. Okay, each one of those things shows a different aspect of human nature in the flesh. But the heart is the seat of emotion. Throughout the Word of God, whenever it says, you know, to speaking of the heart as a place where something comes from in mankind, it's dealing with emotion. It's dealing with a reactionary function. Right? The heart is not rational. The heart of man does not do based off of, well, here's the pros, here's the cons, we're going to make a list. It, it does not work like the mind does, right? Which is why the Bible says, love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. They're two different things. But the heart is reactionary. The heart is instinctive. The heart also can be, you know, something that happens in that short amount of time, that knee-jerk reaction. But it can also be a place where things fester, where things grow. Where those desires or those emotions that it feels... If you harp on those, if you dwell on those, those will become a driving part of your personality or a driving force behind the way that you live your life. Because if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, He will be the thing that we desire most, and that will be the thing that we live after. But if one of those other emotions that come from the seed of emotion, if we give more time, if we give more attention to that, if we feed that desire, then that will drive our life. That's why I've said before, if you love right, you'll live right. Yeah. right. If you love God in the sincere, in the pure, in the holy way that he tells us to have a reverential love and respect for him, if each one of us had that, we would live our life like we loved God. Sure okay. Now, the devices of the heart have to deal with emotion. Amen. Right. The devices of the heart will not try and you know, convince you it is a feeling, it is why we have to be very careful when we do based off of how we feel. Based off of rather than what saith the Lord. Right? Based off of, well, this is what the Holy Ghost is leading me to do. Right? The heart reacts it, well, this is how I feel, so I'm going to do. Right? The devices of the heart will try to get us to do because it is more convenient or because it is more, you know, comfortable to the flesh to do. Okay, now we had to go over that so that you could understand why all of these things have to do with emotion. Right, because that's what the heart is. It is the engine, so to speak, of emotions in your life. Okay, now the first device of the heart is willful ignorance. Willful ignorance. Now there are people that are ignorant because nobody's ever taught them before or because they've never you know, come to a certain... When you first get saved, there are going to be some things spiritually that you're ignorant of. That's not necessarily a bad thing right. or a criticism of somebody that just got saved. They just got in. Right. They haven't gotten to that yet. Right. That's not a sin in the eyes of God. We can go to Noah and look at how Noah didn't know that when he put new wine, grape juice, on the ark, that when he got off of the ark some six months later, that that would have fermented and turned into strong drink. Noah didn't, God didn't hold that sin against Noah, but Noah knew not to do that again. Right. Amen. Okay? We can look at that comparison. as There may be some things that a new Christian doesn't know. Right. There's no fault in that. 
The fault is when you willfully stay ignorant. The heart knows that there are some things that if you get into the things of God, that you aren't going to be able to do some of the things that the heart wants you to do. That's where the willful... Ignorance is bliss for a reason, because you don't understand that what you're doing is in the wrong. Right? That's where the old phrase comes from. You can willfully stay uneducated on the things of God, and that's one of the devices of the heart. It pulls us away from the things of God. It doesn't want us to immerse ourselves in the Word of God, immerse ourselves around the people of God, to immerse ourselves in the duties that we ought to have as a child of God, because if we do, the heart knows it's going to lose. So the heart will tell us that it's okay. You're okay as you are. You're trying your best. What are those? Those are emotions of trying to satisfy ourselves. Trying to appease ourselves into thinking we don't have to get any closer. The church at Laodicea was okay with being ignorant on some things. That's why they were lukewarm. They loved God, but they also loved the world. And they lived that way because in their hearts, they had gotten to the point where it's okay to be where I'm, I'm okay with God. How do you get to that point? You have to be willfully ignorant. Because the word tells us, I'm never going to be in this flesh as close to God as I need to be. That I will never reach sinless perfection. That I will never get to the point, as Brother Mike told us a few weeks ago, that I can take a day off because I'm close enough to God. Right? But that's what willful ignorance will do from the heart. Why does the heart want to stay willfully ignorant? Because there is pleasure in sin for a season. Ignorance is bliss, but there's also a little bit of bliss in sin. And the heart craves that. Because the heart was born in iniquity. It was conceived in iniquity. Its thoughts are continually wicked because our heart wasn't saved, our soul was. The heart is still a part of the flesh. And if the heart had its way, we would be given over, just like the men in Noah's day, continually thoughts of wickedness and doing those wicked things. But if you can live that way and your heart be able to tell you you're okay with God, you can't do that if you're educated on the things of God. You have to be ignorant. Okay, but also willful ignorance leads to pride and arrogance. If I don't know the truth, I can make a stand and justify it to myself as I'm right if I don't know the truth. That's why we're supposed to, Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 3, let your light so shine that men see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven, that this is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path because the truth and the counsel of the Lord, which endures forever, will show us what we really are. This is a glass. We behold ourselves as in a mirror when we get into the Word of God and the things of God. But if I don't know what God says and I think I'm right, that's when pride and arrogance can step in. If a man thinketh he stay and let him take heed lest he fall. If you think you know what you're doing, I'd do some checking up. If you think I've got a handle on this, I'd do some checking up. That may be your heart saying, no, I'm not moving. The buck stops here, and I'm not taking another step. Pride is, I'm not going to do that. Well, this is what the Bible says. If you take a stand, if you are prideful against what thus saith the Lord, you're not right with God. If you're bucking or you're rubbing against the grain that God says this is truth, then you're willfully ignorant. It's one thing to say, well, I've, I've never heard that, but show me chapter and verse on it. Right? We ought not do anything without first investigating making sure that that's what God wants us to do. Right? That's why we're supposed to take the whole counsel of the Word of God. Right? Not, not a segment, not taken out of context, line upon line, precept upon precept. It doesn't say that you know, some segments of what God has said. It says the counsel of the Lord, right. right? In the Old Testament, we can go into the law and we can look at, you know, how we're not supposed to wear, you know, mixed fabrics, but then we also get to where Paul preached that because I'm dead to sin, because I've been resurrected with Christ, I'm no longer under the law. Right. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Right. I didn't check the tags today to make sure that everything that I'm wearing is 100% cop, right? Because I'm not bound to that anymore. But if you don't have the whole counsel of the Word of God, you could have to think, well, I have to wear 100% cotton or 100% wool or 100% linen. Yeah, that. But the counsel of the Word of God would tell us different, right? It's one thing to 
say, well, I've got to search it out and to make sure. It's another thing to say, well, with my lips, I'll say I'll search it out, knowing deep down in here I have no desire to learn what they want me to learn because I want to stay where I am. But that's because of pride and arrogance. I want to live this way and ju be able to justify it to myself. Not justify it towards God because I've been justified in Christ where it's just as if I've never sinned. Sure. Right? He is my justification. Sure. But if I want to justify where I am to God, that's because of willful ignorance. Second thing that can be a device of the heart is envy. Again, talking about emotions. There is envy of others. Okay, that also includes what others have. Last night I said, we, we were talking about, you know, lying and, you know, being a false witness towards God because of the way that we live. God's pretty, you know, big on not lying. It was one of the first ten things that he gave to Moses. Well, envy and covetousness also was in there. Right? We ought not look at what others have and then say, well, why didn't God give that to me? Because that's what envy will do. Envy looks at what I do not have and then says that I am less of a Christian, less of a you know, person, less of a mother, less of a father, because I do not have that thing. Envy defines you based off of what you have and what everybody else has. Okay, Envy also leads to bitterness, if we dwell on it. Right? right? And I, I thought the other day, the fruit of God grows up, but the root of bitterness grows down. The things of God make themselves known, make themselves apparent. They don't try to hide themselves, but bitterness tries to get as deep as it can without anybody knowing exactly how much of a hold it has on you. It doesn't matter where you plant or where God planted that seed. How does the seed know which way is up? I was just thinking on that the other day. How does the seed know which way? Well, if God puts it in you and you keep watering it with the Word and with the Spirit, it's going to grow up. It's going to grow towards the light, towards God. I don't know how it knows, but it knows. But the root of bitterness, it doesn't want to see sunshine. It goes down towards the dark. The fruit of bitterness doesn't make itself known. It just tries to hide itself, and then every now and then you might lash out at somebody. Every now and then you might act and envy Right, Having the sensation of envy isn't the sin. It's letting it take root. Yeah. It's allowing it to become a part. The heart wants envy to be in every action that you take. The heart wants envy to be the driving factor behind your life. Because you look at others and you say, well, I don't have what they have. You know what envy really, when you break it down, says? Envy says, God hasn't been good enough to me. That's what envy, I want what they have. Well, you don't have it because God didn't want you to have it. Maybe God can't trust you with it. I've said, that's why I've, I've always jokingly said, if I ever make it big, you'll know, because I'll get the Aston Martin. I can't handle a V12 engine. <laughs> if I had me that DB9 or the DBS, or I've seen one of the new models that came out. It looks very nice. But I can't handle that. I'll never get that, because God knows I can't handle that. If I did, it'd have to have a governor on it to where I couldn't go over 60 miles an hour. Okay. It sound good, but it wouldn't go fast. Right? I can't handle it. But envy says, well, I want what they have. What you're saying is, I'm not content with what God has given me. That God hasn't blessed me the way that I think I should be blessed. And God either loves them more, or I want to be like them and still hold on to the things of God. Maybe you don't have it because God knows that that would lead you away from God. Envy takes all of that out of it and just says, well, God, how come they have it? Maybe they're not right with God. I don't know. Maybe that's why they have it. Maybe God didn't give it to them. Maybe it was one of the things that they willfully sought out in pride and arrogance. I don't know. But envy doesn't consider the things of God. It considers the things of the world, the material. Okay, And it may not be possessions. It may be the relationships that somebody has. It may have to do with the, you know, opportunities that somebody has or the success that they have, right? But envy also takes our eyes off of God and focuses on fictitious futures. Right. Envy is all concerned about what can I have, what can I be tomorrow? 
Envy is not focused on today. Envy is focused on, well, after I do this today, tomorrow, I want to do this. A week from now, this is what I want to be. A year from now, this is what I'd like to have. Now, the Bible makes it clear that we ought to be prudent. Prudent people do plan for eventualities. But the Bible does say that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Amen. Although it's to plan for a 401k plan, Brother Ray, we talked about that not too long ago. right? Although it's prudent to have that, that if the Lord were to bless us, that we'd be able to you know, continue to live on, to you know, not have to be evicted from a house, okay? even though you're not working anymore. It is not prudent for the people of God to be solely focused on the future. We have been given today. Today is the day that the Lord hath made. Envy takes your eyes off of today and solely looks at what can I have. And you may never attain. That's why it's a fictitious future. No man knows what tomorrow holds. We could lose everything tomorrow if the Lord were to bless us with it. But that's tomorrow's problem. The Lord's already there. He's waiting on us. He knows what's going to happen. He's already got everything planned out. He knows how it's all going to pan out. All I can do is affect today. And envy and that root of bitterness will say, well, they have it and I want it. How can I get it? Yeah. All right, but not only envy, not only willful ignorance, but two of the devices of the heart that go hand in hand are deception and gullibility. Your heart will be gullible, but it also will try to deceive you. It will try to pull the wool over your eyes based on emotion. It will try to get you to see only how you feel, what you feel, and it, it, it will believe something. It will deliberately be gullible if it means that it can continue to feel a certain way. Your heart will tell you a lie if it means that the heart can continue to live in sin or do what it wants to feel the sensations that it wants. Your heart will tell you that you're okay so that you will stay where you are and not draw closer to God. But your heart will earnestly believe a lie if it means that it doesn't have to come up with one on its own. Right? We're very good at convincing ourselves, but if we have grown away from the things of God and we hear something that the heart says, well, hey, that sounds good. That means I can stay where I'm at. And I don't have to invent the lie. It'll walk headlong into one of those devices of the devil if it means that it's saving the heart some work. Right? The heart isn't, you know, spinning all the wheels and not getting any traction. It's looking for the most convenient way to keep you where the heart wants to be. If that means either telling a lie, making up something, and convincing yourself of something that's not a truth, then it'll do that. But if it hears something that it can gravitate towards and keep you in the same spot, it's not going to do all the extra work. That's why they go hand in hand. It'll either tell you a lie or it'll believe a lie. Why? It's based solely off of this is where I want to be and I'll do anything to stay here. Nowhere in a Christian's life should it be this is where I am, this is where I'll stay. It is always walking closer to God. It is growing closer to the things of God. It is becoming more involved in the mission of God, being involved in the Father's business. There is no standing still when it comes to our spiritual growth. There are moments that as we're growing closer to God, we may grow closer to God by standing still and knowing that He is the Lord. We may physically not go anywhere, or in our life we may not be moving, but spiritually we're growing closer to God because we are waiting upon the Lord. Okay, we may have to exercise our faith by staying in the same spot. So I'm not saying that if you're not moving, that doesn't mean you're not growing closer to God. But what the heart is saying is, I don't want to spiritually move. I'm okay here. So it's either I have to come up with a reason to why I'm here. So that I can, if somebody else were to ask me, or when I lay my head down on my pillow at night and I'm under conviction, this is the thing that I can hold up before the Holy Ghost and say, this is why I'm here. Now, we may not understand that it's the Holy Ghost trying to convict us, or it, we may not understand that we're being chastened by God, but in our mind, I don't know why these bad things are happening, but this is why I'm here. Because if we don't have something to hold on to, we know that we're not right with God because we know that 
We read in the Bible. You can be not right with God and get in the Bible where we're on a solid rock. Well, how come it feels like the sands are shifting underneath me? You've got to have a false hope yes. if you're away from the things of God. Yes. If, you're, if you know God, you know that you're supposed to have hope. Yes. So when you get away from the things of God, you have to have a false hope or else you know why well, it was better back at the Father's house. Yes. The prodigal son had hope in the things, the possessions that the Father had given him. And he had lied, his heart had lied to him and said, this is your security. This is your future. And he believed it until it was gone. And when it was gone, when his false hope was gone, he realized, well, hey, it was better. The servants at my father's house had it better than this. I'm going to go back and just ask to be a servant. When did he come to himself, as the Bible put it? When he was in the hog pen, he had nothing. But as long as he had a false hope, he was still out in the world. Yeah, that's true. So your heart will either make up a lie or believe one so that it can stay where it's at and you still have a false hope to hold on to. Okay? But not only that, one of the devices of the heart is hate. Not anger, but hate. Anger, the Bible says that we can be angry and sin not. Again, all of these things... Each one of us are susceptible any moment of any day to feel one of these emotions. It's dwelling on them. It's allowing them to take root. It's allowing the device of the heart to start driving the way that we live our life. That we are complex individuals and complex beings. Right? We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And because God made us, you know, we can't even wrap our heads around some of the things that we do. Right? We've already talked about we can't even know our own heart. Right? But the device of the heart, when that becomes the driving force in our life, we're not using our spiritual motor, so to speak. We've switched. It's like one of them electric slash gasoline cars where if you're going under a certain amount, it don't make any noise because it's running off the batteries. But you get up moving so fast, petrol kicks in, gasoline starts going, and then the injection engine takes over. Okay? We can use either one of those engines but you can't use both at the same time that's why Jesus said man cannot have two masters he'll love one and hate the other the moment that we kick on the engine of the heart the devices of the heart we've already let go of God okay so it's not acting upon them it's not dwelling upon them but not anger it's hate well what will hate cause us to do it will cause us to sin in anger Hate will drive you to do the things that normally you would not do. Hate will cause your anger to lose, what, for you to lose control of your anger. Anger is an emotion that you feel. Hate is acting upon that anger. And when we act in anger, we sin. Be angry and sin not. We've already quoted that. But when hate is why I am acting, the old adage, I, I just saw red. Sometimes we don't even know what we did or why we did it. We just know that we did it because we were angry. It's almost as if we're the you know, third person aspect. We're in the passenger seat. We can see what's going on, but we don't really understand why. Because we've given ourselves over to the emotions of the heart. And one of those devices is, if I can get you angry enough and you act in hate, then the heart temporarily can take control. That emotion will drive you, and you may not even understand why you're doing the thing that you're doing. That's why when you hear stories about how some of these, you know, police will get a call, a domestic dispute, next thing you know, there's irons and frying pans and, you know, cinder blocks flying at people. How did that happen? Well, hate had to be involved at some point. It wasn't just feeling anger, it was acting on it. But hate is more than just anger. Hate is, and the reason that your heart will use the device of hate is because you become preoccupied with whatever you hate. That becomes the driving force in your life. Hate removes everything else and says, this is my priority, the thing that I hate. That's why he that angers you controls you. The reason that whatever makes you mad is always on your mind is because when it makes you mad, that hate starts to boil up. And because it starts to boil up, that's what's in the forefront of your mind. 
Hate will drown out all of the Bible verses that you've memorized. Hate will drown out all of the preaching that you've heard. Hate will drown out that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. And that's why the heart uses the devices of hate. You are blind, you are deaf to everything else except what you are angry at. But hate goes, as we said, further than that. You aren't just preoccupied with it. You act on trying to destroy the thing that you hate. I mean, we can look at the life of Esau. Why did Esau, the Bible say that, you know, God hated Esau. Why did God hate Esau? Not because Esau was born different. God hated Esau because Esau made himself the enemy of God. Everything that Esau did in his life said, I hate the things of God. He rejected his birthright in being the spiritual priest. He sold it. He was supposed to be the one that had the responsibility of keeping the family close to God. He said, that doesn't mean anything to me. When he sold his birthright, it wasn't just saying, I want to give away double my inheritance, because the firstborn got double of what the other children got because he was responsible for taking care of the mother, taking care of the estate after the father were to pass away. He wasn't saying, here's my material things. He was also saying, I don't care about being the priest towards God. He went and he married foreign wives. He said, I don't want what God wants for me. I want what I want. Everything in Esau's life was based off of, I hate the things, I despise the things of God. The grace of God. Amen. And that's why God, the Bible says, hated because Esau made himself an enemy of God. Amen. Sometimes when we act off of hate, whatever we perceive as our enemy, we'll do anything to distance ourselves from it. Esau saw Jacob as an enemy. He said, he swindled me out of it. Anger will lie to you. We don't see the truth. We see what we want to see to justify our own anger, which falls back to some of the things that we've already talked about. But that's the way that the heart works. If it gets one call in you, it's going to get another and another. And then it's harder to resist the devices of the heart because we've not just been ensnared by one, we've been ensnared by many. Right? I don't know how many chains they, out of precaution, put on Samson after they captured him. Right? But it would be a whole lot easier to hold somebody if you had more than just one set of chains on them. Right? You may get a rope around something, but if you plan on holding it for any length of time, you're going to get it close with the rope and then put some iron on it. Put something that's a little bit stronger. Right? And all those old-timey movies, right? When a cowboy's on horseback and it lights on something, if it plans on holding on to it, they put it in a pin, right? They brand it or they'll, you know, hook some sort of uh, harness up to it. They'll put a yoke around it. Why? Because they don't want it getting away. If the lasso was good enough, they just kept the lasso on it. But some of these devices are the lasso. Some of the other ones are the yoke of bondage as the Bible talks about, where we've put ourselves into slavery serving the desires and the devices of the heart. Where he had set us free, we now make ourselves bound to how we feel, rather than living in the perfect law of liberty where Christ makes free. Okay, but the final one, or no, I lied. I've got two more, but they're both going to be quick. Second to find the penultimate point, is lust, which is different than envy. Envy says, I judge myself based off of what I have. Lust is only desire is to have. To lust after something. Sometimes we do lust after people. Right? And certainly we could look at, you know, David and Bathsheba and others throughout the Bible where someone lusted after a person in the carnal sense. But sometimes we lust after friendships. Sometimes we lust after associations. Sometimes we lust after someone's attention. That we think, if I can have that, I'll be more valuable. I just want it. I want attention. I want time. I want association. I want to be in that group. Right? Because once I'm there, then I'll be happy. Lust is, I want to have because I feel like I'm missing something, and that's what I think will fill the hole. Lust will lie to you and say, well, the reason that you're satisfied in the things of God is because you're missing something. But in truth, if we get into the words of God, if we're not satisfied, that means that we've pulled away from God. 
So we're not as close as we need to be. But if we've fallen victim to some of the willful ignorance, well, I'm where I'm supposed to be with God, not knowing or ignorant of the fact that God wants us to be somewhere else, and we start looking around like David did when he should have been off at battle fighting, but instead he's looking around on the rooftops, and then he saw Bathsheba, and his heart said, well, if you had that, you'd be happy. Sometimes we lust after people. Other times we lust after positions. If I had that, if I was this, if I had this title on the business card, right? If I was the one that was in charge of the checkbook at the house, if I was the one that was making this family decision, if I had it my way, we'd be doing this. That when we taught on the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus said that, you know, if a man says in his heart that I want that woman, he's already committed adultery in his heart. He's already guilty of it. Because that's a two-way street. But what you're saying in your heart is, if I could, I would. Lust says, if I can, I would. And in our heart, we've already sinned. We're already in a far country in our heart, but the opportunity may not have presented itself yet. Lust says, I'll do anything to get the thing that I want. You'd sell your own soul, if you could, if you weren't sealed by the Holy Spirit, to get what it was that you wanted. You'd give away time, you'd give away money, you'd give away possessions, you'd give away people in your life, you'd give away the fellowship with your own Savior to get what it is that you want. That's what lust will drive you to. Now again, in the sense of feeling the emotion and doing it, we may not understand that. But we can step back through, you know, hindsight being 2020, through the counsel of the Lord, enduring forever and always being true, we can see that that's what lust will do. But in the moment, we're not thinking about that. All we're thinking about in the moment is, I want. I have to have. Okay, but the final thing, and this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but we only have a certain amount of time. But one of the other devices of the heart is complacency. It's the sensation or the feeling that I am okay. This right here is good enough. I'm as close to the fire as... If I get any closer to the things of God, I might get burnt. No, but if you do get close to the things of God, your face might shine a little bit. You might get a holy sunburn, like Moses. But I promise you, Moses wasn't in any pain. I don't know if you've noticed, I'm not just white, I'm neon white. When I get sunburned, it hurts. Ask Christian, he's got photos from the last time we took a cruise. Right? I put lobsters to shame when I go out in the sun. I was in pain on that cruise ship after the sunburn. Thankfully, it was towards the end of it. Right? But I had aloe vera everywhere that the sun hit. Moses wasn't like that. You get close to the things of God, there's no pain. But complacency will tell you, well, if you get close, it's going to hurt. Well, it's going to hurt your heart because your heart's going to have to give some things up in order to get closer to God. Because if you are tentative or if you are fearful of drawing closer to the things of God and releasing more of the world to get closer to God, it's because your heart doesn't want to give something up. If you're all in, it's what thus saith the Lord. Whatever he said. Doesn't matter what I have to give up or what I might miss out on. That don't matter because the things of God are more valuable. Right? I would rather have what God wants me to have than what I want to have. But complacency he says, no, I want to have what I want to have. And I want to have my cake and eat it too, so to speak. I want to be in fellowship with God, but also do the things that I want to on the side. If that's your desire, if that's where you're trying to live your life, you've already walked away from God. You don't realize it yet, but your heart's lying to you and telling you, this is, you can be okay right here. Okay, that's the end goal. But it starts with first having no drive to continue the things of God. When... Well, you know, I don't, I don't have to read my Bible this morning. Surely yesterday's devotion will be good enough for today. Surely the verses that I read yesterday will hold me over. I've, I've read something or I've heard preaching somewhere along the way that will have to do with what I'm going to face today. Well, you may have, but God may have wanted to refresh you on it that morning. Complacency says, I don't have to. And it takes away your drive. But also complacency will halt your movement. Not just for the things of God, but also towards God. 
Complacency says, I'm not walking today. I do believe that Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. That implies movement. We are to take up the cross that he bore and continue to bear it. To take it to those that haven't heard of him. That should be our desire. That should be our drive in order to facilitate our movement. But if, you, if the heart can take away your drive, you're not going to move. And if you are stationary, it means you aren't advancing against hell in the world. You aren't advancing against darkness with the light of truth. You're not taking the counsel of the Lord to the world. Instead, you've stopped. And we are written epistles known and read of all men. Right. Amen. That word epistle, that's another word for a book of the Bible. Some people may know, they may have been associated with some of the things of God, but they want to look at your life and see if God truly is in what you say. And the moment we stop moving, we are saying, I don't really believe what I've told you. There's no proof in the pudding, so to speak. You guys know where that phrase comes from? It comes from tapioca pudding. I've never had it. But when they make it, they put something in it, and there's something in tapioca pudding that's not in regular pudding. Okay? And at the time when the original person made tapioca pudding, somebody across town or down the street somewhere found out how to make something that kind of tasted the same and looked the same, but it didn't have whatever it was inside of the pudding that tapioca has in it. And tapioca, or whoever it was that made the tapioca pudding, said, yeah, taste and see. Proof's in there. But the other people said, no, if you want to taste it, you got to buy it first. That's where the world is. God says taste and see because God wants us to continually desire the things of God. To continually reaffirm the faith that we have put in Him so that our drive and our movement stay in action. But the world wants to say, no, if you want this, you've got to stop and you've got to pay for it first. You've got to be all in before you can taste it. And then when you finally get a taste, you realize this isn't what I used to have. But the heart will tell you, no, you're okay without whatever it was that was in that pudding. It may not be the same, but it's good enough. You're good right here. You don't have to do You've handed out enough. You've told enough. You've been enough. Brother Brian, you've gone to the jail enough. Somebody else can do it. You're okay. It wants you to be complacent rather than being content. There's a difference in the two. Content is, this is what God wants me to have, and that's all I need. Complacency is, I don't want that. I want to stay here. I don't want what God wants for me. I want to be right here. I'm comfortable. This is what I'm used to. It's not convenient anymore. Based off of how I feel, rather than what my spirit is telling me, because his spirit bears witness with our spirit, not just to tell us that we're the sons of God, but to tell us when we get in the word how close we are to God. Amen. And when his spirit compels us to come forward, the feeling of what well, the flesh just doesn't want to. Even the Apostle Paul said, there are some days that I do what I would do, or I do what I wouldn't do, and there are days that I don't do what I would do. In other words, it's always a battle. It's like Wednesday night. The whole armor of God will help us fight that battle. But complacency is the feeling that says, I don't need to put that armor on today. I'm good enough. Complacency is the feeling, and we said this before, the shield of faith, the Bible says, will quench the fiery darts of the devil. Doesn't say it'll stop the darts. It says it'll knock the fire off of the dart. Yeah. The fire is what will do you damage. Right. You've got armor on. A dart's not going to hurt you. Yeah. It's the fire that's going to catch on the leather of that armor, on the fabric underneath of that armor. Amen. That's going to do you the damage. I can handle the dart, but complacency is what says, I'm tired of getting hit with darts. Mm -hmm. And you put the shield of faith down, and then you're hit with the fire. The place it sees the emotion is the sensation that's trying to get you to just let your guard down enough that you get hit by another snare or another device of the heart. Or the heart can walk into one of the devices of the devil so that it can stay wherever it's trapped. Because the heart doesn't want to move closer to God. The heart wants to stay right where it is or get further away. And if it's in a trap, 
It can't, you can't go nowhere. That's why you're trapped. That's why it takes God to undo it. Because if I could have undone the traps of sin, the traps of the devil, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. But the devices of the heart, we know what they are. We can study it out. But all of them have to do, I just don't feel like doing what God would want me to do. I would rather do this. This is more important to me. And when we recognize it, when we understand how it works, when we feel those things, no, by the grace of God, I won't. Lord, help me with that. Lord, I'm sorry for having the thought, but help me to not act on the thought. I'm satisfied with you, but I also have a desire to draw closer to you because I can only imagine it's going to get better and better the closer I get. I'm not wanting anything, but I just want more of you.